Is your magic meter running low? Well, we've got a cure for you. Welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff Topoli, and today on the show, I have Len Testa from touringplans.com joining me to discuss the brilliance and projects from Imagineer Joe Rohde. Earlier this year, Joe retired from Walt Disney Imagineering after 40 years with the company. Some of his earliest projects included Work and World Showcase, but he became an Imagineering superstar when he was made the lead Imagineer for the creation of Disney's Animal Kingdom. At first glance, the public just thought of him as the man with the earrings, but we soon learned that this man, who didn't look like many other public figures at Disney, had a whole bunch of talent to share and reshaped the Disney theme park in the process. Our chat about Joe is coming your way right after this. If you happen to follow Imagineer Joe Rohde on social media, you'll know that he's often sharing his endless wisdom about design and storytelling. In the process, he shares some of his research resources. Recently, he posted about the Joseph Campbell book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which dissects the mythic elements of the classic heroic journey in storytelling. This is the same book that George Lucas credits for the success of Star Wars. If you'd like to check out The Hero with a Thousand Faces for yourself, you can get yourself a free audiobook of it right now at audibletrial.com slash dctc. After all, Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. In addition, they have a bunch of Disney audiobooks that you can find simply by typing Disney in the search bar at audibletrial.com slash dctc. So what are you waiting for? Go and get your free audiobook and support this very podcast at the same time at no cost to you. The site is a-u-d-i-b-l-e-t-r-i-a-l dot com slash dctc or simply click on the link in this episode's description. It's time to dive into today's Disney Dialogue. Hello, Len, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast for the first time, direct from touringplans.com. Thanks for being here. How's it going, Jeff? Thanks for having me. Pretty good. And today we're here to talk about somebody I love. I feel like I don't know anybody in the Disney fan community that doesn't love Joe Rohde. True or false? Oh, totally true. I don't know anyone who's ever uh, said a bad thing about it. I mean, everyone who who has ever met or even heard of uh, Joe Rody knows that he brings passion and integrity to his projects. Yeah. So it was pretty big news when his retirement was announced. I mean, yeah. it was one of those things. It's like, I guess it's inevitable, but nah, yeah. he'll always be an Imagineer. <laughs> Right, like right, yeah. I mean, you, you know that, like in, in the back of your mind, it's like this day was going to come at some point. But like, you thought that'd be, you know, when you were retired, you know, forty years from now as well. Exactly. So on January fourth, twenty twenty one, imagine your Joe Rody did retire from the Walt Disney Company, and he had this to say. He said, "It's been forty years since I stepped foot in the door at age twenty five, not knowing anything about theme parks, Disney, or what it meant to work for a big company. Every day of my life since then has been a learning experience." I'm very glad to have had that opportunity and proud of the work that has been done, not just by me, but by all my fellow Imagineers, and especially those who worked by my side over the decades. But 40 years is a long time, and this strange, quiet time seems like a great opportunity to slip away without too much disruption. If I wait, I will once again be in the middle of another huge project, and by the time that is done, I would be truly old. I'm not that old yet, and there are things I want to do that cannot be done here. So that's beautiful and everything, but I got to be honest, the first thing that came to my mind was, do you think this was 100% his decision considering just how many layoffs there have been? I mean, he got to make a nice chunk of change, I would assume. Yeah, I uh, I don't think it was. I, let's put it this way. I think uh, it was one of those things where there was a conversation had about whether Joe, uh, Joe was going to be around to, to his point for like the next 10 year project. So, you know, Disney was probably looking at this and saying, do I want someone who, am I going to put Joe on a 10-year project where he's 75 when it's coming out? Or do I put someone who is 25 on it, he'll be 35 when it's coming out? So I'm sure that conversation was had. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I hope he gets to do, and I'm sure he will. He is such an adventurous spirit that he'll oh, yeah. go on to do so many things. And I'm excited to see what he does outside of Disney. But, I mean, he really, he became an Imagineer rock star. And through yep. the years, we have had these Imagineers that are very public and to a point, it feels like the company puts them out in the spotlight, like they want them to be the Imagineer rock star. I'm not sure how that happens, but how did that? How do you think that happened with Joe? Well, I mean, I think for Joe, it was that he was the Imagineer that was put front and center for Animal Kingdom, which we'll eventually talk about. He was, he was there in the press conference with uh, with Eisner, right when they announced it, and so and obviously he, his vision for the for the park. I, I, don't, I don't know that there are any other Imagineers who's vision is so encompassed in a single park other than Joe Rody and Animal Kingdom. I mean, they're essentially synonymous, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. And he really is that like rare mix of an extraordinary talent who's an artist, but also someone who can work within the politics of a giant corporation. And I think yeah, most I mean, people... For, for, for 40 years, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think somebody with his adventurous personality, they often have a hard time with controlling nature of corporations. And the fact yeah. that he could walk that line beautifully from at least the point of view of the public was quite impressive yeah if you think back to his his earlier stuff you know starting at epcot with uh working on the sculptural aspects of the mexico pavilion right so like the pyramid and things like that he comes on to he comes into to the walt disney corporation during a a period of huge expansion right they're trying to build an entirely new type of theme park one without characters right um but also you know they're running short on money so he's he's got you know it's like saying you've got all the creative freedom you want for ten dollars right yeah. like <laughs> your budget's your budget's a hundred bucks here's your gift card go he came in at an interesting time he was also there when the last of the first generation of imagineers were sort of retiring right so the the Ryman's, the henches uh, you know, and things like that. So the people who built Epcot, right, were the, um, you know, so the last of the original era of of Imagineers. So we got to learn from the from the masters, right? And I think that's that continuity was really important over the next forty years. Because if you think about what Joe's done, right? I mean, starting with the Mexico Pavilion, going through to, um, uh, you know, his work in Animal Kingdom, he really did not rely on intellectual property franchises of the Walt Disney Corporation, right? He, he did it based on authenticity and uh, the natural, you know, for Animal Kingdom, for the natural world, right? But you look at his most recent projects, right? Uh, Pandora, Guardians of the Galaxy redo, Tower of Terror. He, he sees which way the wind is blowing in Disney. And, and you know, I think along with his, dis part of his decision calculus, I think, Jeff, was... Am I, do I want to do this for 10 more years? Yes, I completely agree. And there's a great moment in the Imagineering story yeah. on Disney Plus where somebody asked him, like, well, what if you're assigned to a job that doesn't really excite you? And he said something like, well, that's my job to get it to excite me. And I do think about that. And, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll start going through some of his accomplishments and we'll talk mm -hmm. about those moments where – I, there are some projects that I'm like, I can't imagine he was initially that thrilled to be put on this assignment. And on top of that, us looking in at the rock star Joe Rohde, yeah. we probably, I'm sure there were people who were like, oh no, he's like number one. He can pick and choose what he does. It's like, no, that ain't how it oh, works. Yeah, that's, that's not how working works. It's not, yeah. not what a job is. Yeah. So All right. it's interesting. You mentioned Epcot and we're going to go through his projects. Of course, he had his hands in so many things. We won't get to them yeah. all. But Epcot, you know, that is where he started in the Mexico and Norway pavilions as a model maker and painter. And he says, he said many times, he wasn't very good at this job. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, of course, <laughs> I'm sure he was better than most at the job, yeah. but uh, I'd be curious to know like what specifically in his resume got him hired. If he was put onto these positions that he claims he wasn't really the best at, I wonder what it right. was specifically that was like, this is the guy to bring on to Epcot, the second park for Walt Disney World. Well, don't forget, uh, you know, at this time in the late seventies, Disney's hired, you know, over a thousand Imagineers mm. to work on Epcot. Joe obviously has a ton of talent, but if, if you showed any modicum of talent 
at that time. It was like, or, you know, you're hired and you're working on the pavilion, <laughs> uh, you know, on the on the pyramid. Here's your uh, sculpting tools. You start Monday, kid. The fact that he made it through the cut, because remember after Epcot opened, there was a huge, massive layoff, right, at Imagineering. But so between the time he got hired, I guess in, was it 80? He said he's been there 40 years, so probably 81. 80, 81, yeah. So by the time the layoffs came in 80, 83, uh, 82, 83, uh, you know, he had shown enough to someone to make it through that that cut. The other thing I would say is, you know, if you think about the Mexico Pavilion, the interior of the Mexico Pavilion, I think is the best realized of any of Epcot's pavilions. And I would say the the second, my second favorite pavilion in Epcot is Norway. And after the Norway Pavilion opened, I actually went to the real Norway because I loved it so much. Wow. And I went, so uh, I went and I tried to find everything that was in the Epcot Norway Pavilion that was really in Norway. Um, and most most of it's in Oslo. It's not like I had to scour the countryside. Most of it's in Oslo. But yeah, it's a, a beautiful town. And, and the, the pavilion inspired me to travel there in real life. Yeah. That is some fantastic Disney fandom nerdum right there. That is awesome. So the funny story is, is I um, so I um, I found the uh, the Stave Church that's at the front of the pavilion. So it's Norway has a an architectural museum that houses entire buildings. Like oh wow, and so they and so they have this entire Stave Church life size. Uh, it's from the city of Gaul, um, but you can walk inside. It's beautiful on the inside. It's all wood. Yeah, but I uh, but I basically walked around uh, Norway for four days looking for things uh, looking for things in the Epcot Pavilion. Yeah. Okay, Disney you needs to use that in order to get their country sponsors and be like, right? listen, listen to this guy. He literally flew to your country because of our pavilion. You need to sponsor this. So do you, uh, have you, do you remember the old film at the end of the Norway uh, ride where um, – Yeah. Uh, like the Spirit of Norway. Okay, so remember there's a kid who – it's in the, uh, the boat museum and this kid runs up to the boat. So I wanted to recreate the scene, you know, where I where I run up to the boat and I look up at it all admiringly, and but I'm like, I don't speak Norsk, which is it wasn't that much of a problem because everyone speaks better English than I do in Norway. But I uh, but I find someone in the um, in the Viking Museum, and I'm like trying to figure out how to explain like what I want, you know, using <laughs> gestures and everything in Norsk. And it turns out the guy looked at me, he's like, Oh, you're from the states. I'm from Canada. Like, okay, here's my, here's my camera. Just, could you just film this? So. Uh, so funny. But yeah, it is true. Like, if you really think about his pavilions, Mexico and, and Norway, still beautiful today. And yeah, the, I feel like inside the Mexico pavilion is kind of this hidden gem. I know as a kid, yeah. I don't think I rode the ride in there until I was an adult. And oh, right. yeah, I just, it wasn't one of those stops that, was a priority, I guess, as a kid in Epcot, but hmm. like going in there, at least as a teenager or something, I was like, wow, this is absolutely gorgeous in here and creates such a cool vibe. And, you know, even has that portion where you can kind of like the blue Bayou at Disneyland, where you can sit and eat and watch the attraction ride by, I think is oh, yeah. stunning. Uh, very, very, very cool. And yeah, I mean, that's a great place to start for Joe Rode and he did fantastic work. Something I want to talk about that I sadly never experienced. I'm curious if you have the Adventurers Club and Pleasure Island. Yeah, amazing. Um, I was every time I was there was super crowded, so I never got I think the full experience of it. But imagine you know a a, a steampunk themed club with multiple stories where every inch of the walls was covered with photographs or memorabilia taken on an adventure somewhere. It was like the ultimate, uh, you know, reading or cigar room, three stories tall uh, with all kinds of Disney props, right? So, so props on the wall talked and not only that, but the cast members who interacted with you, it was almost like dinner theater, but in the round, I loved everything about it. The, 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 the one thing I didn't like about it, it was, it was so darn popular. It was impossible to get a seat most nights. Hmm. And so it was uh, there were so many regulars that it was difficult for new people to come in and sort of fit in, but just an amazing experience, N not only the architecture, but the way that the show was integrated in to all of it. I, I distinctly remember the first time I came in and thinking, you know, if I ever have a house big enough, I'm doing a room exactly like this. Every time I go somewhere, I, you know, I think like, you know, I should, I should get a souvenir and put it on a wall so that 40 years from now I could have a collection like the Adventures Club, it was a, it was an amazing thing. Um, so true story, 
uh, may or may not have broken into the Adventurers Club after it uh, closed. Oh no! Very was not it gonna, like not not going to admit to anything? Um, well, if you had done it, was there still here, stuff hy- on the hypothetically, walls? Hypothetically, yeah. hypothetically, there was nothing on the walls, but hypothetically, there was the giant. It was either uh, Zeus or Ernest Hemingway naked. Okay, uh, fly fishing. I, depending on how you look at the statue, I may have a photo of me and me and that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because it never happened, but if it did, it never happened, of course. Yeah. But, you know, the thing that's so funny is I think, you know, at least me, the photos I've seen of it, I picture this is what Joe Rody's house looks like. Right. Or the inside of his mind, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Definitely. Like that. Joe head. This is what it looks like. Yeah. It just, it was an amazing space. It was. There's the, the, the thing that you could do with that is you could make it like overly masculine. Mm. Right. With all like the the travel stuff and the again, the nods to either Zeus or Ernest Hemingway, depending on how you look at it. Um, but it wasn't. It was, you know, it was the the color um colors that he used in there really sort of soften soften the tone of everything. So sort of I, I believe like sort of like a salmony peach color on the walls, which really yeah, uh brought the masculinity down to make it welcoming to everyone. And then again, the show scenes were great. People loved it. There's like talk of bringing it back every few years. I mean, it's definitely got this fan base and now it's become kind of this mystery to people like me who haven't experienced it like i don't even know is it a show that's scripted beginning middle end or is it improv or is it murder mystery like what is it it was so it's there's a they have loose rules right so um you know there's a set of uh roles in there there's uh you know maids and um people who are in the adventures club and i forget all of them and it's sort of a loose script or a theme that they followed, but it was mostly improv. And it, the the interesting thing about it is the people who worked there went on to do basically every other improv role within Walt Disney World that was done. So street mystery characters, improv comedy, you know, the comedy clubs and stuff like that. They were they were very smart people. And I think a couple of them actually went on to real acting gigs in Hollywood as well. So it was um, it was one of the things where you had to be quick on your feet because you're dealing you're interacting with the guests and you never know what they're going to say. So super talented people, you know, all of them. But yeah, I mean, to say that there was a script, um, it would probably be an overstatement. You know, it's one of those things I would love to see brought back just because I want to experience it. Yeah. But also, I'd love to have like sat in on that pitch meeting because it doesn't. <laughs> I know that Pleasure Island was a little bit weird for Disney to begin with, but this feels yeah. like really out there. It was. It was the most ambitious I think of their of their offerings. Yeah. They need to like recreate it for the D twenty three Expo or something, even if it were temporary. Like, like to, to have it in a hotel in a resort. If it was in a resort, you would never get in, right? It would have to be. You know, that size again. I have the perfect way to do this. Okay. I have this whole thing where I really, really, really want Disney Vacation Club to build in New York City, considering how big Disney on Broadway has become. I'm like, the fact that DVC doesn't have a home base in the heart of Manhattan to kind of, and with a theater inside and stuff is crazy to me, especially right now, since real estate's lower than it's probably been in decades in New York. But if they were to build that, oh my gosh, stick an adventurers club in there. And that would be huge in New York City. Yeah, I mean, and especially in Times Square, it would it would totally go because Times Square is, is like that, right? It's all spectacle. All right, Disney people listening, we're doing your job for you. <laughs> exactly. Buy that real estate. You just want to send the checks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. But yeah, I mean, that the the spirit of the Adventurers Club definitely felt like a Joe Rohde spirit. And oh, all the way, all the way. Yeah, it's that's crazy. They got to bring it back. They got to do something with it. Anyway, let's jump to the big one. Disney's Animal Kingdom. This is where mm. he was lead Imagineer. This is where I feel like the public really started to know, oh, who's that guy who doesn't exactly look like Disney, but, you know, is leading this giant Disney project and doing an incredible job. I don't know if the earring collection had started right at the beginning of that. It would have been 90. I think so. I think that, I think he had, he had earrings by, by then. Yeah. So he didn't exactly have the Disney look, but he certainly had the Disney spirit and creativity. And, I mean, Disney's Animal Kingdom overall as a park is... You know, it's it's funny because people will always ask you to put your favorite Disney, Walt Disney World parks in order. And Disney's Animal Kingdom is always last for me, not because... Really? But here's why. His task was to make nature look 
re- you know, fake nature look real. And he right. did it to the point that I'm like, that's not impressive because it looks so. It looks like nature. You know, it doesn't look <laughs> like somebody made it. <laughs> he just threw some some walkways down here, and exactly. we're walking through. Yeah. So yeah. it's like so impressive. I'm so impressed by it, and, and just even the infrastructure of the park as a whole. If I had to rate parks. You know, my, my favorite park is Epcot 1985, right? But, okay, sure. Uh, but that doesn't exist anymore. The thing that I like about Animal Kingdom is it's the most cohesively themed of all of the parks. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, Magic Kingdom would be number two on there. but And then there's like a wide gulf between uh, the, uh, those two and the other two parks. But if you think about what the Animal Kingdom is supposed to do and how it does it, it's by far the most consistent of the parks. And that's I think that's directly attributable to the fact that one guy basically designed all of it, right? Which at, up to that point, I don't think had really been done that much. It felt like the other parks had felt like a team effort, whereas obviously right. there's a huge team working on Animal Kingdom. But to have him as a lead Imagineer, it really feels like his vision in an incredible way. I think so. And there are times, you know, when you walk through the Animal Kingdom and you come across like these little details and you think to yourself, you know, my God, that's, you know, if Joe Rody was standing here saying, I made this, right, you, you could not be more obvious that it's a Joe Rody thing. So in, um, in the Maharaja jungle trek, mm-hmm. if, you, um, if you go past the, the tiger encounter on your right, and sort of, it's sort of like on a side wall that's not directly facing the walkway, but there's a triptych and it's, uh, so three panels and it's man learning how to live in harmony with nature. So in the first scene, man cuts down trees. In the second scene, um, there's flooding and all the crops wash away and all the animals run away and man is shown in despair. And in the third panel, um, it's man uh, replanting trees, living with in harmony with all of the animals, <laughs> you know, and all the fruits and vegetables are back and everything. And I'm like, and, it, and this is done in, uh, it's, it's carved in plaster in three panels. You would not, you will, of, the, of, a, of a thousand guests that walk, through that attraction, 999 will walk by it without even looking at it. But for that, for that one person who looks at it, and it's by the way, it's read right to left instead of left to right. For the one person who reads it, it's like this is basically the motif of the animal kingdom spelled out for you in the middle of Maharaja Jungle Trek. And I, I, I got to admit, I only noticed this last year, so 20, 20 some years after the park opened. But it's stuff like that where, you know, you walk through the park, you notice a detail and it's like, how long has this been here? Who, who thought of this? Right? Yeah, I found something just uh, this past October that I'd never noticed before. And there was, you know, how on a lot of like the distressed walls, they'll have painted advertisements and such. Yep. And I found this like VHS one. I'm a VHS <laughs> nerd. And I, I was like, what is this? And how long has this been here? And how many pictures am I going to take of it? Because this is just incredible to have this oh, yeah. 80s culture stuck right in the middle of Disney's Animal Kingdom. And it was that in the, sense. Was that in Harambe? I remember I was in line waiting for uh, it was an extended queue out into the park for the um, for the safari. So yeah, it so been, Rumba, yeah, yeah, it would have been around there, and it's very very cool. Of course, you know, he did the overall look and feel and everything with the park, but then some big big attractions came out. Expedition Everest was a huge yep. thing for Disney's Animal Kingdom. Now this is the one. I mean. This is the thing that Joe Rody had promised by the time he was done with the company that Yeti would be fixed. And this is probably the thing he's regretting most, is my guess at this point. Uh, you know? Maybe not most, but it's, it's probably up there and saying it. Yeah, it's, you know, How every time I go it by. How long did it work? How long did that thing work? 20 minutes? An no? Hour? What was that, no. like a year or something? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I did it's, experience you know. it once when it was working. Yeah, I saw it once when it was working too, yeah. And, but no, uh, it, this is going to be the hat box ghost <laughs> of the animal kingdom, right? We're going to we're gonna tell our kids like, no, dude, I saw it move. And they're going to be like, uh-huh, now it's time for bed, right? <laughs> That's hilarious. But Expedition Everest is still a massively cool attraction. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's something that Disney's Animal Kingdom really needed um, at that they point. It needed a big thrill ride, yeah. yeah. It did. And it's so beautiful. It's one of those things that feels like it's always been there. And... I remember watching one of those modern Marvel specials about it. Do you mm-hmm. remember this on TV? And yeah. 
I remember one of the things they were really proud of was when you're climbing the hill, you don't hear the click, 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 click sound of it essentially locking so you can't fall backwards. And they like invented something to prevent that noise. And I was like, that's incredible. And thank you for doing that because I hate that noise. That's fantastic. The uh, The thing I love about Expedition Everest, and, and, and tell me if you agree with me with this, Jeff, but like, you know, what, uh, when you first uh, leave the station and you're sort of going on a curving, gentle tour of the countries countryside i would take an entire ride of that oh for right? sure in fact i would probably prefer it like i am not much of a when it comes to coasters i'm like i just want to have fun i don't want any fear involved yeah. and i'll tell you there is a moment in expedition everest that makes me uncomfortable and it's the backward portion it's it's i i don't even mind going backward but there's something about the g-force or whatever yeah it's pushing you down yeah it's it's a weird sensation that i really do not like in that attraction i, I can feel the blood draining from my head when that happens because the way the g-forces go and it, it i would say about a third of the time that i ride it i get a headache from it but yeah the uh it's it, so that's the not pleasant part of it but the rest of it especially like the front seat experience on Everest is a, is a really good coaster experience. Even the climb up the hill at the beginning, the view you yeah. get is great. Yeah. It's a, I did love one detail. I don't think I've seen it on for years. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, they used to have like misters all over the mountain to make it look like snow oh, kind yeah, of no, blowing the wind. That's, yeah. that was such a beautiful detail that I loved such a Joe Rody detail, you know, yep. that unfortunately has been shut off. Um, but one, I don't know. Do you think the Yeti will ever be fixed? Do you think? No. No. I it's think just, so. I mean, it it's just not the is. way that, the, yeah, they're not going to spend the millions of dollars needed to do it. They'll spend it on something else. It might become a projection at some point. Who knows? Like, I mean, if they've got, they've got, they've got wind on it. So the hair moves, they've got the strobe lights, you know, they're, there are other things that the animal kingdom needs beyond that. Yeah. Let's talk about Pandora, the world of Avatar. Now, this, of course, had two giant attractions. Well, one giant and one smaller. I prefer the smaller. I love Navia River Journey. And then there's Flight of Passage. And this was a major expansion, of course. You know, this was in response to Harry Potter, most likely. Totally, yeah. And it's the thing I like about it most is how much it fits in Disney's Animal Kingdom, as far as the story of, you know, nature and all that, which is why I get a little irritated when I hear, what was it? Was it Tokyo? That there was talk of Pandora heading over there. One of the overseas parks, there was like rumor mm -hmm. of that for a while. And I was like, come on, you just like, I felt like they invested a lot in convincing us. No, like we get it. This is an IP thing, but it makes sense in Disney's Animal Kingdom. And I bought into that and I was like, yes, yeah. I accept it. So by saying, yeah, and we're going to put it here. I'm like, then, then this story doesn't matter that, that you told us. Right. Yeah. The, the thing that I like about Pandora is I, I don't care about the movie at all. Nobody, I don't think anybody really cares about the movie. Right. Um, but the setting works in the animal kingdom. The other thing that I like about it is walking around inside Pandora, um, especially like when I was first covering it for the book, there's not a bad view mm. in Pandora. Like any angle, anywhere that you sit, there is something pretty there. And there's also uh, a lot of water effects in there. So you get this dynamic feel of things moving all the time, which if you think about Galaxy's Edge, which Joe Rody did not work on, Galaxy's Edge feels lifeless a lot because there's there's not yeah. really a lot of movement there. So if you think about two contemporary Disney lands, both, you know, with large budgets of the two, which one feels better? Pandora feels better. Do I like the story as much? No. Is it a better land? Probably, you know, but that's what Joe does, right? I mean, he he makes it feel natural, even though, you know, we don't have floating planets and strange plants floating in the water, you know, normally. He, he, he did a great job of coming up with a nature that doesn't exist, you know? Yeah. Now, do you have a favorite, uh, preferable attraction in that land? Um, I like Navi River Journey. I think it's, for what it is, if the wait's under 20 minutes, I think it's super pleasant. You know, I Flight of Passage to me is is fine. It's, you know, it's basically soaring over Pandora. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really emotionally invested in it. Yeah. Right? Um. And again, I think it goes back to the story. I mean, technologically, it's a tour de force, right? It's yeah. the, the technology there is amazing. You know, I just, I never cared about the Pandora characters. The thing I love about Navi River Journey is, I mean, obviously the shaman is my favorite yeah, the audio animatronic amazing, yeah. of all time. But I loved the mix, the, the projection stuff mixes better yeah, yeah. than in anything I think I've ever seen. Uh, 
it's convincing. Yeah, when they're using it for it's basically like a multi-plane camera, right? Where yeah. they're doing different because they'll they're doing layered projections at mm-hmm. some point. In the, yeah, and even the one like the first Navi you see, where there's like an arm holding a staff or something, and I think the arm is like a legitimate thing, but then like the rest of the body's projected and projected. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is. It's so convincing, which is why I know it's crazy to say, but I prefer that attraction over Flight of Passage because, like, I don't know, just practical versus projection is always right. going to win for me, or at least usually. It's a it's a good attraction. There's nothing wrong with it. Like I said, for a wait of 20 minutes or, or, uh, or so, yeah, it's not bad at all. Yeah. So also in Disney's Animal Kingdom, this was something that was added after opening. I don't know how involved Joe Rody was with this. Maybe you can answer that for me. But Dinoland USA... Because this is the thing. I think Joe was doing a lawny while this one was coming. (laughs) Because this is the corner. I will say, I did do an episode all about the backstory of Dinoland USA. The backstory makes a lot more sense. Oh my gosh. Well, it's episode 757 of this podcast, if anyone wants to listen. But it's the backstory is incredible and actually made me really appreciate the land but i do picture joe Rody walking through there like putting blinders on and being like yeah. let's pretend this especially chester and hester <laughs> like let's just pretend this doesn't exist but uh so you don't think he was very involved i can't see any joe Rody touches in dino land okay so that makes me think he's not involved i mean if he was it was basically in dinosaur or in the countdown to extinction as it was but i don't see how the rest of Dino Lane gets made over Joe Rody's dead body. Like, like I mean, <laughs> yeah. what wood in there makes is consistent with the rest of the land. There's nothing. It's just. Yeah. But the original version of Dino Land, where Chester and Hester's is, wasn't that supposed to be the excavator? They had, um, they had like dinosaur bones. It was like a museum display sort of thing originally. And it was like temporary tents and stuff that you would walk through. And right. So the, so the the from, from what I understand, the backstory was the end scene of Dinosaur, where the where the the meteor hits or the comet hits, mm-hmm. the meteor hits. There's supposed to be this massive show scene, much bigger than what we actually got, and like you know on something on the scale of Universe of Energy. And then you know the the meteor hits, and then when you're done and you go outside of the dinosaur building and you go to the area where Chester and Hester is, you're supposed to be in the exact same spot, 65 million years later. Oh, and cool. so the dinosaurs that you saw in the last scene of Countdown to Extinction were then being dug up. Oh, and wow. that was supposed. To, but think about that. That brings the whole land into a cohesive whole, right? Now it's the same story, yeah. just told through time. Yeah, that was that. That's great. I'd never heard that before. That's oh, awesome. I have the concept art. I'll send it to you when we're done. Yeah. Oh, please. Uh, now there is one thing you say it makes everything makes sense as a whole. There is one thing about Disney's Animal Kingdom. I ended up writing an article for Attractions Magazine about this because the theater in the wild does not right. tie in. But I, I have a solution. And I, okay, I'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts on this. So obviously, if you have the Dino Institute, and this is a place right. that a lot of scientists and tourists are coming to visit, you're going to need a convention center and stage of sorts to give presentations. Sure. So all you need is to slap some posters on there of upcoming speaker, Dr. Marsh, uh, Dr. Seeker, Professor Wayne <laughs> Zielinski, and then a poster that says, on tour, Finding Nemo. Because let's face it, these spaces and colleges and stuff, they'll have, uh, or theaters and cities, they'll have tours come through and they'll have oh, like sure. su- yeah, yeah, yeah. speakers come through. That's all they got to do to make it part of the same story. I Come on. That makes uh, that makes complete sense. You know, I, I, I know that theater in my head, I know that theater in the wild is in Dino Land, but to me, it's always in this sort of this like no man's land between Dino Land and Asia. I know it's so weird, but it is technically Dino Land USA. So I'm like, if you're going to put that name on it, Dino Land USA, you need to work it. They worked so hard creating a story that really is. If people haven't researched it, do it because it's so, it makes it so much better. And yeah, just that little touch would make me very happy. Put those posters. All right. We'll see. I, I, I'm not sure that Finding Nemo is coming back, but we'll see. Well, whatever ends up in there next. Yeah, whatever ends up in there, yeah. 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 Uh, one thing that, you know, has not happened at Disney's Animal Kingdom, but Joe Rody has been asked about is Zootopia coming to Disney's Animal Kingdom. And his response on Twitter was, the animals are proxies for humans and human issues rather than animals in their own right-facing animal-related issues. We try to enforce the no-pants rule, classic characters <laughs> accepted. And... You know, that totally makes sense. I get that. Yeah. But, I mean, Zootopia is going there, isn't it? 
you know, I think this is one of those things where, you know, where Time Joe to might retire. look at this and say, yeah, am I, am I going to fight this battle for the next 10 years? Or am I willing to, to do it? In the, with the current park leadership or the current company leadership, I don't see how you avoid characters like Zootopia and the Animal Kingdom. It's just, it's too obvious, especially if they go ahead with, the, with another film uh, and it's, uh, it's successful. People are going to want to see the characters. And where else would it go? I mean, it's not going to go in the studios, right? Yeah. The, the, it makes the most sense for animal characters to be in Animal Kingdom, right? Yeah, so that's, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a an argument uh, regularly with an Imagineering and Joe Rody. But in any case, let's move on to Awalani, a Disney resort and spa in Hawaii. Now, you've been there, right? Several times. It's Disney's best resort. But it's my favorite resort. Okay, it's my favorite Joe Rody project of all time. Like, I'm obsessed it's with it. And oh I am God. not a relaxer. At all when it comes Neither to vacations. It's so like the first time I the first time I had somebody tried to put me on a cruise ship, I was like, look, here's what's gonna happen. One day you're gonna wake up, there's gonna be a life foot missing. <laughs> and and just know that I had to I had to do what I, I did what I had to do, right? I'm gone. But yeah, I mean Alani, I, I've been to Alani and not left for like a week. Yeah, I know. There's no I kept saying that my family wanted to like go on these excursions. I'm like, <laughs> why I'm good <laughs> hanging here. Like yes. this is li- I think it was the most relaxed I ever felt. Yeah. In my entire life. And, you know, it was smart to put him on the project because he grew up in Hawaii and obviously had a lot of respect for the culture. And right. it's it really is this, you know, it has all those Joe Rody touches. It even has, you know, everybody loves the tree of life and the hidden animals in the in yeah. the trunk of the tree. You've got that all over the rock work in Awalani. Yeah. It's created this oasis that I don't know if you went to, there's, I think, three resorts kind of surrounding Awalani. So if you're facing the ocean uh, to the right is a Four Seasons and I think, was it a Marriott? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I'll, I, I walked to the Four Seasons to see it and you know, to watch the sunset and stuff. And then I've walked to the other couple of resorts, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't usually go very far. Well, but here's the thing that's so incredible. Like these other resorts, these are all like very expensive five-star yeah. sort of resorts. But when you go to any of those, literally like right next door, they don't even compare no, the theme to like Aulani. <laughs> it's not even close. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Aulani is next level Hawaii resort vacation. And the thing I love about it is it starts as soon as you get in. You come into the, you go into the entryway, and it's this perfect open air framed shot of the inside of the grounds and the beach. Like it's, my, the, so I, we took uh, Laurel and I've been there a few times. We took our daughter there for the first time in December of 2019, and she cried. She wept when she saw that 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 entryway. Like like. This is the perfect Hawaiian thing. It was amazing. It really, really, truly is. The only thing that I would love to see to make it better, and I'm guessing environmentally this can't happen, but I wish there were fireworks shows to watch from the <laughs> beach. I mean, I want to, I, I want them to put a, a barge out in that water and launch some pyro because <laughs> we could you could do that from the pedal board. You could go we could we could go pedal boarding and hold up sprinklers or something, maybe. Yeah. I mean, but everything about that resort is perfect. The rooms are nice. The food is exceptional. The spa is amazing, right? The cove that they have, the little lagoon is is perfect. The You can snorkel with fish. It's got another pool. There are adult areas. I mean, it's just... Even the song. Oh my gosh. That, <laughs> that song that they used in all the marketing in the beginning, I was obsessed with it. And yeah, but... I remember going to the resort and being like, you have to have a CD of this. And they're yeah, like, we... actually, we can't sell this song because it was a gift to the resort. This was like a, a Hawaiian musician created oh. the song as a gift for the resort. So we cannot sell it. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Get home from vacation, get an email with an MP3 of the song. Thank you for visiting <laughs> Awalani. I was like, you literally just made my life right now. Like the one <laughs> thing that was missing, other than fireworks, from this vacation, yeah. you've emailed to me. Amazing. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I love Awalani. I would I would go back. It's uh yeah, I would go back as soon as you know we can all travel again. It's like I said, we went in December of 2019. I stayed I think I went to Safeway like twice, you know, to get some mochi and stuff. <laughs> monkey pod across the street. Was that what it's called? Monkey pod? Remember that? Yeah, right? monkey pod. Everyone goes yeah. to monkey pod, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I walked there too. Yeah. I mean, but like I would, I was perfectly content spending, you know, seven consecutive days at Alani. And people were like, oh, don't you want to go see the Pearl Harbor M- Memorial? Like, That's very nice. You know, don't you want to go see Waikiki? <laughs> don't you want to do the, uh, you know, the drive? I'm like, you know, I, 
I've seen nature. I, I'm good. I'm good here. Like I'm. I like I'm Joe Rody nature. Joe Rody yeah. nature is better than the real thing. <laughs> I would prefer. I would prefer a slightly, a slight, a slightly man-made nature to whatever you got there. Yeah, but I mean, I, I you, you can paddleboard. It's uh, yeah. It's just the weather's perfect. Everything about it's just fantastic. It really, really is. I obviously, it's not a cheap vacation, but if you're saving up for that once in a lifetime vacation, yeah, absolutely, do Awalani. It's. It's, it is it's Disney's best resort. I mean, there's stuff for the kids to do. There's a, what's the game? The uh, like the scavenger hunt. Game oh yeah, the, I did it over. You pick it up at Auntie's it's, Beach it's House you, or something. Auntie's Beach House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, but uh, that's something to do for an afternoon. You know, in between naps or whatever. It's like the the Epcot World Showcase. It is scavenger yeah, yeah. hunt thing. And again, you can snorkel with fish. There's a mm-hmm. ton of stuff that you can do. It's, there's water slides. And magic bands are heading there, aren't they? I haven't heard that. I think yeah. I heard uh-huh. the. I, I think I heard the magic band technology is heading there, which kind of makes sense because right now you need to get a wristband every day to prove that you're right. staying there to use their pool. Oh, a magic band would be great. So a magic yeah. band would kind of fix all that and, you know, other stuff. But yeah, Awalani, amazing. But let's get to kind of Joe's last big project, and that is Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. And mm. this was one, this was the one I honestly think he was talking about in that Imagineering story when he's like, yeah, sometimes you are assigned to things you don't want to necessarily do. Uh, I could be completely wrong, but that's my guess. You yeah, know, why, why would you pull Joe Rohde into that project too? I mean, it seems like there's a, a dozen engineer, uh, engineers that could have done it. I mean, having said that, he did an incredible job in my opinion. I do love the attraction and I was not thrilled about exactly. Tower of Terror closing. And, you know, obviously knowing the big picture now that a whole Marvel area was coming it makes sense. It's still the ugliest building on any Disney property anywhere. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Joe, if you ever hear this episode, but I hate that <laughs> building so much. But other than that, the attraction, the ride is a lot of fun. And the story makes sense. And you know, one, one thing he talked about that I thought was really quite brilliant and I'd never thought of was he's like, well, this up and down sensation, you get yeah. the fear option, but you can also have this fun option of being like tossed in the air like you were as a baby. I was like, wow, that's something I'd never really thought of. And it's right. That's that sensation that you get in Guardians of the Galaxy. It's not scary. It's just it's not no. weird fun, you know? Yeah, I, I too thought that they were just trying to do a, a layover or an overlay for Guardians just to, you know, as a marketing push to promote the latest film or whatever. But I did like the the overlay. I thought it was fun. It was in the spirit of the film. It looked like everyone involved with it had fun with it. So yeah, I mean, considering the project he was given, uh, that must have been a scary, daunting test. And actually, wasn't it just revealed in an interview with him that Guardians wasn't even necessarily the thing? They they knew they wanted it to be Marvel, but it wasn't. Right. That wasn't always the first choice. And. I'm glad they landed on that. I feel like the, I am not a Marvel fan, but I feel like Guardians is the most universally appealing. Uh, that and like Spider-Man, maybe. I feel like non-Marvel people go to see Guardians. It has a sense of humor that a lot of them, like if you're just not into action movies, which I am not, right? Yeah. They're, it's a very funny movie. I, I think the, the scripts are funnier. I um, I Over uh, Christmas break, I rewatched all of the Marvel films in order. Oh gosh! To get ready for one division. I could yeah, never. twenty. There's twenty twenty four hours of my life that I'll never get back. Um, no, but it was it was fine. I mean, the the very first Thor movie was not was not great. But yeah, so that 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 sort of made sense. Guardians, I think, is the funniest and cleverest of the scripts. You can kind of see a little bit of it in Ant Man. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like I said, the the ride the ride itself. I I went in thinking this is going to be. A stupid overlay that I'm not going to like. And I came away. I was like, yeah, it's not bad at all. I'd go on it again, you know? So, yeah. And it's not like it took over the tower in Florida. That would be devastating. Right. It w- well, it wouldn't fit in Florida uh, chronologically. It just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Although that's not going to stop Disney from other things. Right. So, <laughs> right. so. yeah. But, uh, you know, now, now that WandaVision's out, I kind of just want a WandaVision attraction <laughs> because the, I just want to go through those different TV sitcom eras. Like <laughs> that should be the new ABC Bistro. ABC Commissary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they should totally. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. 
Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I love WandaVision. I hope they do something with that. We think about what's in Animation Courtyard right now. Other than Disney Junior, there's nothing there. Mickey and Minnie's open. Runaway Railway should have been there so that we could have gotten an updated great movie ride, but I digress. <laughs> Exactly. Ugh. I love Runaway Railway. So, yeah, so there's Guardian. Some smaller things he worked on through the years. He was involved with Fantasyland 1983 at Disneyland, which was obviously this huge, massive project. Right. Captain EO, he de- he developed some characters. It feels very Joe Rody. It makes sense. It does, yeah. Yeah. Disneyland Paris. He did Festival Disney, which is now Disney Village. Uh, he was working on Lighthouse Point, wasn't he, for Disney Cruise Line? I thought he was, but I don't know where the development where that development is right now. My guess is that's just paused because with three more ships coming online by 2025, they're going to need more than one island for people. So kind of a shame that he's not going to be around for that because you know he would have done a, a spectacular job there. Yeah. And now, had you heard anything about this? I heard this thing that he was he was one of his big projects might have been making Disneyland more cohesive. And I heard that he wanted full control, very much like he had with Disney's Animal Kingdom, if he were going to do it. And f- the story I heard is that was not going to happen. Had you heard anything about this? I've not. Okay. I, frankly, I'd be surprised that Disney would spend the money on something as abstract as that. Okay. Right? I mean, you can argue how cohesive Disneyland is right now or how you could have – how cohesive it, it could even be given the fact that the lands vary from fantasy land to tomorrow land. Right. I mean, that's, that's difficult, you know, for, you know, within a land, you know, could it be more cohesive? Like could tomorrow land in, in basically every domestic park be more cohesive? Yeah. And that by itself is a project, but I, you know, I, I would be surprised if something like that got approved, frankly. We'll never know at this point, but uh, I'm sure there were a couple of big projects that he was being considered for that we'll just never see. And yet, listen, 40 years, how lucky are we? So my big thing is, and I, I, if I, I, I've, I've met Joe like 17 times on different media things and whatnot. The, if I ever see him again, my first thing is going to be like, my first question is going to be, what are you doing with all of the papers and all the documents that you've accumulated over the years, because I would love to see the Joe Rody archives. I mean, he'll probably post a lot of that stuff on social media. And that's one thing yeah. I want to talk about. This guy was a giant, is a giant personality. You know, yeah. uh, he he interacted with fans a lot on social media. I know I just would randomly text a question about something in Disney's Animal Kingdom to him, and he'd write back with a really, really? like sincere, thoughtful answer. And he's so thoughtful. I'm sure you've seen him in numerous panels. You ask Joe Rody a question and there's like a good 10 second pause as he like calculates in his head the best way to say something. And I yeah. love this about Joe Rody. Like the man's a genius. He's next level. Yeah. I mean, he really cared too. And like, he was passionate about the stuff. He had the talent and he also cared. And that's the big thing. Not only that, but he cared about like a specific vision, you know, and he executed it really, really well. Yeah. I mean, there's a, it, it, it leaves a void in Imagineering, you know? So, so the, my, my favorite Joe Rody story is he showed up. So think about what Joe Rody, I mean, Joe Rody's a busy dude, right? Mm-hmm. We, uh, when uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom started the Wild Africa Trek, mm-hmm. I happened to snag reservations for first Trek, first opening day. So I show up and I'm, I'm, number one, I'm super excited just to be there on opening day, but it gets more exciting because Joe Rody was there to introduce the animal track. And I'm like, this is like a minor tour in, in a theme park that did not get a lot of fanfare, right? Like, I mean, it wasn't even sold out, I think, on the first day, right? But Joe Rody comes in to, to explain what his vision was for the trek. And I'm like, who would do that? Right. It's not like it's a major new ride. It was a minor thing. Yeah. And Joe Joe's there in the morning. He's like, come on in. We got we got box breakfast for you. Let's <laughs> It's the roadie difference. It's it's definitely it's true. He really cared. There's gonna be a void. And you know, even in the early days, I love those videos you see of him now as Dreamfinder, which is yeah. hilarious. And you know, he's his likeness is Harrison Hightower the third over at the Tower yeah. of Terror in Tokyo. And uh, you know, he's he, I, he's never going to be gone from the, he's one of these, he's right, like yeah, a Tony yeah. Baxter where he'll be back for a billion panels, a billion yeah. interviews. I wouldn't be surprised if he continues his adventure by Disney expeditions that he takes people on. Uh, he's not gone by any means. He's just, no, no, no. He's yeah, yeah, definitely not. Yeah. So he's incredible. I do want to know how long do you think it's going to be before he becomes a Disney legend? Uh, not more than five years. I, like, 
I would be shocked and kind of pissed, honestly, if the next go around, he's not named a Disney legend. It's sort of like the Hall of Fame. You got to wait a certain amount of time uh, to make sure that you're not coming back. We but, waited uh, 40 years. That's enough. Like, I get it. Yeah, they don't want to give it to yeah. people who are still with the company. He's not with the company. Give it, I mean, he's he's got to become one, right? Yeah, I would definitely within five years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wonder where they're, they're going to put his window. Something somewhere in Harambe, I'm thinking. Yeah, you know, the window. Now, yeah. that's a. Are there windows typically off? You know, not on Main Street, USA. I don't know, but they can make an exception, right? They I mean, they, they need they to. I mean, it needs yeah, to be exactly. in Disney's Animal yeah, Kingdom. Yeah, put it in Animal Kingdom, yeah. Yeah, that would be that'd be cool. So, wow. Lots of fun stuff. Before we get to trivia, I wanna why don't you let the folks know who are listening that may not know about touring plans and what you do and the incredible stuff that you guys offer. Oh, cool. So uh so the website that I run is called uh, touringplans.com. It's an offshoot of this book I write called the uh or I co-author. It's called The Unofficial Guide to Walt Disney World. So Touring Plans actually was my master's thesis. In graduate school, I went to Hollywood Studios, then MGM Studios, um, got stuck in line for two hours, a great movie ride, and decided there needed to be a better way to see Disney theme parks. So I went back and told my thesis advisors that I wanted to write a computer program where you told it the rides you wanted to ride, and it told you the order in which you should ride the rides to minimize your weight in line. Uh, that became my master's thesis. It's how I met Bob Selinger, who co-authors The Unofficial Guide, um, and I eventually turned that into a company with an app. Or you can t- tell it what you want to ride in Walt Disney World. It'll tell you the order in which you should ride it to minimize your weight in line. Yeah, so that's uh, touringplans.com. We also have a number of other uh, crazy features. We have this um, this thing where we took photos of the views you get from all 35,000 hotel rooms <laughs> in Walt Disney World. It's super crazy. Um, and then well, you can actually pick the ones you want to stay in. Yes, yeah, so that's touringplans.com. I also do this podcast with uh, Jim Hill. It's called uh, The Disney Dish with, uh, with Jim Hill. And that's on uh, DisneyDish.BandCamp.com. If you wanted to write to me, I'm uh, Len at TouringPlans.com. Fantastic. And before we hop over to trivia, two little things in current news I'm curious to get your opinion on. Because we all know with Disneyland, you know, the whole annual pass program going away. For me, this whole, like, no free parking anymore is, like, deal breaker for me. So I'm curious. I do get that, like, with Disneyland, you get a lot of people showing up uh, alone. Do you think there'd ever be a pass where you could get, you know, the top tiers like before where with this membership, I should say, yeah, where they'll say if there's two or more people in the car, the parking's free. Otherwise, you're paying. How would I guess the, I guess they could do it right then, like, you know, at the parking yeah. garage. Basically, your pass has the ability to have free parking, but the person. That's not a bad idea. Because that would cut like. Their problem is, I mean, obviously, they built a whole new garage for the amount of people. And listen, I'm not going to lie. I showed up to Disneyland a ton of times alone and met up with mm-hmm. friends in the park. So I feel like that's kind yeah, of a solution. Like carpooling is free. That's not a bad idea. And, you know, Disney's Disney, the corporation, has this concept of a carbon tax internally, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that would that would work into their, their carbon neutrality uh, platform. That's a great idea. I think they should do it. Disney. Easy enough to enforce. Disney do it. And the other thing is, what do you think this is going to do to cast member sign-ins? I mean, are those going to exist? <laughs> yeah. Especially with the size of the company now, with Marvel and Fox and all them. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know how many of those people are getting it, but like, come on, this has to be going yeah. away, right? I, you know, they may, they might limit the uh, the number of sign-ins that you could do. What's the, what's the number now? Um, it's, I think, 16 times a year you can get in up to four people, including yourself. Yeah, so that might be something like, you know, uh, 12 times a year or eight times a year or something like that. And then with, you know, with blackout dates and things like that. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, That's, I, you know, I was amazed at the, uh, uh, at the, the reservation window and then the number of, uh, the three things to me that were, were interesting, the, not the reservation window so much, but the number of reservations you could hold at a time, the number of blackout dates that you could attend. So it was either one or two yeah. in all versions of the past. <sighs> that's very limited. Um, and then, yeah, the options for, for free parking. So you couldn't have, at least in the surveys I saw. I was going to say, this is all survey. None of this exists yet. All this survey, yeah. And there were different versions of the survey. But in every version of the survey I saw, you could not have at the same time free parking and max pass. There was, a, there was no amount of money that you could pay to get both the uh, max pass and free parking, which was amazing. Like, why not just charge for one or the other? Because if you add in parking, right, let's say you go you know, twice a month 
To me, it's a deal breaker if there's no free parking. Deal. Well, it's like another seven hundred dollars on the cost of your annual pass. Like now you're talking about two grand. As it is, I'm already pissed about the ten dollar parking to go to downtown Disney just to buy food and, and shop. Like seriously, I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, right Valley now, at least, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, right now, I'm talking about like what a insane yeah. thing. But in any case, uh, yeah. Do you think Premier will be back at all? Because that's honestly, I, I really want the bi coastal pass back. I don't. I don't think it's going to be publicly available. No. Ugh, it's miserable. I hate that. <laughs> In any case, anything else you want to say about Joe Rody or anything we've talked about before we get some trivia? You know, it, it's he's one of the last. You know, of the big name Imagineers, he's going to be missed. But uh, you know, we'll always have his work. And every time I go into the Animal Kingdom, I think about him. So there's a, there's probably no greater tribute to a Disney Imagineer than than doing something like that. You know. Absolutely. So let's get to some trivia, folks. Do you know the answer? Get your brain gears churning and play along. It's trivia time. All righty, Len, do you want to hit me with a trivia question first, or shall I hit you? Uh, I'll give you one. So uh, so Joe Rody actually voices one character in a Disney theme park. What's we the have the character? same exact trivia question. What's the, uh, what's the attraction? That's All amazing. right, go ahead. It's the American Adventure, and he is the voice of <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> Yes. I Good love job, that. Jeff. This is one of very few times where the, the trivia questions have matched. And I honestly love that because, for, first of all, I did not know this before doing research for this episode. Did you know this fact? No, actually, we didn't do research for this episode. I found it out, yeah. That's crazy. So, I mean, yeah. he was Dream Finder at one point in yeah. Epcot. Now he's like, you know, until the attraction closes, which I hope is never, he's the voice of Alexander Graham Bell. That's pretty awesome <laughs> it's great that we both thought of it too that's that's fantastic so i was going to ask you about harrison hightower at one point actually what did i read not only can you see him in the tower of terror oh i think was it in guardians that there's some place else oh no no mystic manor did you know that mystic you, manor you yeah. can see him as harrison hightower in that i didn't as well. it, but but it was in my research too so that's i didn't know it before that yeah yeah so I there's mean, apparently also a, a hidden reference to joe Rody in harambe somewhere in animal kingdom and i read somewhere although this one felt a little bit insulting but the, like the the yeti painting on the way up the climb is supposed to resemble him if you look at like the, the high <laughs> forehead and the eyebrows and so i was uh, like yeah. really that feels insulting if that's what they were going for but that's funny. Uh, regardless, this was so much fun. Thank you for taking the time to chat about all of this. Once again, the website is touringplans.com. And uh, thanks so much for spending some time talking about the brilliant Joe Rody. Uh, this was great. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. This was uh, super entertaining. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation about Joe Rody. If you're not already aware, you can now call into Disney Coast to Coast and leave a voicemail sharing your thoughts on episode topics. Gerardo did just that as he shared his thoughts on a recent DCTC episode all about Disney California Adventure and its 20th anniversary. Here's what he had to say. Hi, Disney Coast to Coast. I just want to say I loved your DCA episode so much. Uh, I thought Sam was an awesome guest, uh, as always, and I could listen to you both talk about that park forever. Um, the only sad part about it was that it made me miss DCA even more. So I hope we get another episode to talk about it more. Uh, and especially, I would love to uh, hear you talk more about the entertainment. I, I think really entertainment was a thing that really upped the game for DCA 2.0, especially shows like Five and Dime and Red Car News Boys, which I love. And even the citizens of Buena Vista Street, I think they were all hugely important in, in that new phase of DCA. And I do hope they come back soon after they're probably they're not going to be there probably when the park reopens but i do hope they come back soon after because i think they're an amazing amazing thing um and once again thank you for your awesome content and for being a source of that much needed magic if you'd like to leave a voicemail call 818-860-2569 to share your thoughts on today's conversation for the chance to be heard on a future episode once again that's 818-860-2569 or find the number in this episode's description along with a link for some free gifts from me to you one of those gifts includes a collection of joe Rody's posts sharing wisdom about the disney parks in a document i like to call on the roadie again as I said, you can find the link in this episode's description or head to DisneyCoastToCoast.com and click on free.
Now, folks, on last week's episode, we had a conversation about the Disneyland Resort discontinuing their annual pass program, as well as Walt Disney World ending Disney's Magical Express. Be sure to check it out if you haven't done so yet. And next week, I'll have more of the latest Disney news to share with you. The easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of the magic is by subscribing to Disney Coast to Coast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Wherever you search, don't forget, it's Disney with a Z, Coast to Coast. You can find links and info about the topics mentioned in this episode by checking out the show notes at DisneyCoastToCoast.com, or you can find a link to the show notes in this episode's description. Help ensure more free episodes of the podcast and gain rewards by joining the DCTC community at Patreon.com slash Disney CTC. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast. Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This podcast is part of the DePodcast Network. Learn more about this show, plus find more quality and entertaining podcasts at depodcastnetwork.com. That's D-E-Podcastnetwork.com.